Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So your gaming group has decided to playtest 1D&D, and you decide to give the new bard a try. Last time you played a bard, it was frustrating when you use your bonus action and a limited resource to hand out inspiration to your party members, only to have them forget to use them and have them expire. So what you decided to do was remind them. Remember, you have inspiration. Remember, you have inspiration. Remember, you have inspiration. And you felt annoying. And you decided, you know what? Next time I'm making a character that gets to use their own resource. Then you read the expert class's playtest and you saw that now the bard has complete control over their own resource. Your ally misses an attack. You use your reaction to provide the inspiration to turn it into a hit. Your ally fails a saving throw. You use your reaction and you provide inspiration to turn it into a success. This sounds better to you. But then you get to spellcasting. Well, first off, you're now a prepared spellcaster. A 5th level bard used to have 8 spells known from the bard's spell list. These spells could be any spell level you could cast when you receive them, and you could switch out one spell at each level gained. Now you prepare exactly 4 spells of 1st level, 3 of 2nd, 2 of 3rd, the same number of spell slots you have for each level of spell, and you can switch them out to any spell available to a bard after each long rest. You're also going to have two additional spells prepared, Healing Word and Lesser Restoration. Well, I guess technically you get three extra spells prepared, then a 5th edition bard would have spells known. And they're easier to switch. And now we can switch our cantrips too, but there's the added restriction of how many spells for each spell level. All things concerned, we're probably coming out a bit ahead. But then we get to picking those spells. The 1 D&D Bard says any spell you prepare must be an arcane spell, and it must be from one of the following schools of magic. Divination, enchantment, illusion, or transmutation. So now you need to go to the arcane spells list. So, four first level spells, and you need to work your way through this list, which includes abjuration, which you can't cast, conjuration, which you can't cast, evocation, and necromancy. They're all unavailable to you. And then again for second level spells and again for third. You'll have to go through this process again after every long rest where you decide to switch out your prepared spells, going through a list where a good portion of them aren't even available to your character. This is just obviously harder than picking from a class spell list. You ask yourself, why are they making this harder for me? A class spell list is an easy system, and now they want me to use this more complicated system. Players must be telling the designers after every survey that this isn't adding anything to the game. It just makes spell selection harder. Yet, with every playtest, it seems to still be there. Why is that? Now, I'm not going to tell you what to think about whether the three spell categories is good or bad, or whether it's going to survive the playtest process. The purpose of this video is to explain why I think they're categorizing spells this way. So let's put ourselves in the shoes of somebody on the D&D design team. And let's say, hypothetically, we as the design team are to abandon spell lists and revert to the 5th edition method of class spell lists for 1D&D. So in 2024, we release a new player's handbook, and the bard, cleric, druid, paladin, ranger, sorcerer, warlock, and wizard all have their new class spell lists. The spell names haven't changed, so the old artificer spell list is perfectly compatible, or maybe they have a sidebar or something with updated artificer spell lists to reflect any appropriate changes. So that's great. Works just fine. You play a bard, you look at the bard spell list, you're set. Why did we even want to change this? Then in 2025, we released the new source book. And we'll call it, what will we call it? Let's say, Jarl Axel's wide-brimmed hat of everything. Honestly, that name wouldn't be surprising at all for a new source book. X is X of everything, right on brand. In Jarl Axel's wide-brimmed hat of everything, there's a whole bunch of new spells. So we put in a little box like this, listing the new spells and which class spell list each spell belongs to. We're still okay. Let's call one of those spells Jarl Axel's Eye Patch of Warning, available to wizards, sorcerers, and bards. They also have a new class, the Witch, which also gets their own class spell list. Then in 2026, we have a new setting book. We'll call it Greyhawk, the Valley Mage Rises. In that campaign setting book, we have a new class, the Silent One, which is able to cast their spells without verbal or somatic components. So when drafting the class spell list for the Silent One, we look at 
Jarl Axel's eye patch of warning and decide, you know what? This is kind of a perfect fit for this new class. But how are we going to put this on our new class's spell list? Because Jarl Axel's eye patch of warning had already listed sorcerer, wizard, and bard. We can't go back in time and reprint Jarl Axel's wide brimmed hat of everything, so our new class is just not going to be listed in that book. So how are we going to let them know? Well, I guess when we do the Silent Ones spell list, then we need to have Jarl Axel's eye patch of warning listed there, but then the player who buys that and who doesn't own Jarl Axel's wide brimmed hat of everything isn't going to know what Jarl Axel's eye patch of warning is. So then I guess we need to put a little asterisk or something beside it. And then at the bottom, we would have to say, this is found in Jarl Axel's wide-brimmed hat of everything. And we have seen this kind of thing already in 5th edition. If we look at Fitzman's Treasury of Dragons, we can see we have a Shardalon stride. The Artificer gets it. Artificer isn't in the player's handbook. So they need to put a little asterisk beside the Artificer. And down at the bottom... Then they have to say, this is where you can find the Artificer. It's not in the player's handbook. You can find Tasha's Cauldron of Everything or Eberron Rising from the Last War. So then a player who buys it, who doesn't own those books, will know why they don't know what the Artificer is. And that works okay when you only have like one additional class that's not in the player's handbook and a few spells that are in the player's handbook. But the more you add, the worse this is going to get. Then in 2027, we release a new source book, Raceland's Pendant of Everything. Why break the mold? Brand new class, The Mystic. So we're designing The Mystic, and we just can't help notice that there are some spells in Jarl Axel's Wide Brimmed Hat of Everything that would really fit The Mystic. We also notice there's some spells in Greyhawk, The Valley Mage Rises, that would also really fit The Mystic. So... Do we ignore those spells and exclude them from the class list? Or do we add them? In which case, now we need some entries with one asterisk and other entries with two asterisks. And now our asterisk uh, guide at the bottom telling us which book they need to go to for which thing is getting bigger. Furthermore, now we have new spells and some of them are going to fit some of the classes that we've previously released. Some will fit the silent one and other ones are gonna fit the witch. So our list of new spells and which classes they belong to, like this one, are getting more and more complicated because now we need to have the witch on there, we need to have the silent one on there, neither of them are in the player's handbook or in the current source book, so now you have to have two asterisks at the bottom, one for the silent one and one for the witch, and you can see where this is going. As we go on, it's gonna get worse and worse. And the same thing with every new class's spell lists. We're going to see more and more spells that aren't in the player's handbook that are in various different source books. And the more source books you create, the worse this problem is going to become. So why didn't this problem really occur in 5th edition? It's been around a long time and there's been lots of source books. Well, they've had a policy that you can see very clearly in their subclass design as well as where they choose to expand the game. The Artificer is the only case of a new class in D&D. Do you think there might have been some ideas for other new classes? You bet. There probably were tons of ideas, but they couldn't really do them because if you are going to do a source book and then you put a new class in it, you have what we see right here, where when you create another source book, Whenever you reference that class, you have to put a little marker to let the player know where they can find it. And that's okay when it's one class, but what if it's 10 classes in 10 different source books? Are you really going to print this in your book? Of course you aren't. This would be a nightmare. So you don't do it. So everything you reference in your source books has to go back to the player's handbook. And if you want a game that is continually expanding, that is terrible. That is crippling. Because how do you do that when you only have one book? Your first book is the only one you can reference in your other source books. So the source books don't mesh together at all. You create new spells in them. You create new classes in them. You create new subclasses in them. And they can't reference each other they can only reference that initial book. So let's say we decide, you know what? 
we will just print this. We're going to print the asterisks as we need to in the various books to reference which other books they're from. Well, why were we complaining about the spell lists in the first place? Because we would have to go through this list and we would have to filter out the spells that we didn't qualify for. So what if there's 20 source books and 20 source books referenced in a class spell list and you only have 10 of them? Well, you're kind of in the same situation, aren't you? And the more source books they release, the worse it's going to get. But what if we stuck with the playtest spell system? What happens then? Well, we print Jarl Axel's Eye Patch of Warning. It's Arcane Divination. The Mystic has access to divination spells on the Arcane list, so if Jarl Axel's Wide Brimmed Hat is in play, then the player knows that spell's available. And if not, well, then we don't need to reference it in Raceland's Pendant of Everything at all. Olidimara's Cloak of Night is Divine Illusion. That's it. We're done. No need to reference this spell specifically ever again. If a player is using the Greyhawk setting book, then there's no need to list who gets access to the spell, including classes and source books that come after the Greyhawk book is released. It all takes care of itself. Now, I didn't even include the possibilities of new subclasses that might open up new casting options for classes. Like, maybe there's a new Bard subclass that's nature-themed, and instead of drafting a list of spells they have access to that is entirely static, instead we can just say they have access to Primal Transmutation spells. Then, whenever we draft a new Primal Transmutation spell, there is no need to update the Bard subclass with the reprint. The expanded spell availability is built in. Now, I want to repeat, I'm not here to tell you that you have to like arcane, primal, and divine spell lists over class spell lists. And if you don't like them, then you should continue to tell them that in your surveys. What I am here to tell you is why I think they're trying this out. It's not that they want to have the 2024 Player's Handbook to have an added degree of complexity. I mean, they've already committed to having lists of available spells for each class or some other method to make spell selection easier with the official 1D&D Player's Handbook than we've seen in the playtest so far. It's that they want to have a reduced complexity for each book that comes afterwards. New spells have a category and a school. New classes and subclasses have access to specific categories and schools. And that's it. One source book in the future, 20 source books in the future, and there's never a need to own source book 6 to understand an entry in source book 14. So from a design perspective, I am pretty sure that's the reason for spell lists that we've seen in the 1D&D playtest. Now, personally, my opinion on them is a bit conflicted. I totally understand the reasoning in regards to the future expansion of the game, and frankly, I figure the game probably would be more smooth several source books in the future using the Arcane, Divine, and Primal lists. But on the other hand, I'm thinking it's not as smooth for the 2024 Player's Handbook. So... You know, I don't have a strong opinion one way or another, but I've been asked why I think they're doing spells this way, and that's what I think it is. Whether they'll stick to their guns on the big three spell lists, time is going to tell. But until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.